Hello everyone, welcome back to the General Chemistry Lab once again. This is our last lab in the spring semester and uh, I wanted to mention uh, something important before I forget. Since it is our last lab, typically right after you completed this experiment, you would have to go through your drawer and do the checkout and you've uh, been given an opportunity to remove your goggles and other personal belongings that you might have stored in your drawers uh, because of this extraordinary situation that we have uh, all been thrust into in March. Obviously, you are not able to come back to campus. And uh, I wanted to address questions I got over email regarding your goggles and other things that you clearly want to get back because they're yours and uh, you will need them again uh, for other courses that you're gonna take in the future. So uh, what I wanted to let you know is that uh, once uh, other employees um, such as our stockroom manager are able to come back to work uh, over the summer, we will go through your drawers, retrieve your items, label them, uh, put them in uh, Ziploc bags and store them for you. So the plan is to have you come back to the prep room here at Mosley Hall or some other possible location and uh, retrieve your belongings. Uh, once you are back here, hopefully, we don't know yet, but we are remaining hopeful that we'll be able to have face-to-face -face semester in the fall. And so uh, at that point, you'll be able to obtain your things back. So don't worry, your things will be safe with us and um, we'll get them back at a later time. So now we can go ahead and talk about the experiment that um, we have for this week. The experiment title is Determining uh, Sodium Bicarbonate Content in Alka-Seltzer. And I wanted to show you this. This is actually Myers' uh, version of um, antacid pain relief medicine, which is a um, generic version of Alka-Seltzer. So Alka-Seltzer is an over-the-counter medication that has two active ingredients. One uh, which is responsible for relief of pain is aspirin and the other one responsible for antacid action is uh, sodium bicarbonate also known as baking soda. The chemical formula for sodium bicarbonate is shown right here. We've talked about it, the fact that uh, sodium bicarbonate is a salt which is a basic salt and uh, the way it is able to uh, relieve heartburn uh, is the same exact reaction that you're going to be absorbing in this experiment today. It's a reaction between sodium bicarbonate in Alka-Seltzer and uh, hydrochloric acid, HCl. Many people don't know this, but HCl is a, a major component of stomach acid. It is the stomach acid. The experiment uses much higher concentration of HCl than uh, typically present in the stomach, but nevertheless, the reaction that occurs is exactly the same um, what you're going to see in the experimental setup when I demonstrate it, and, uh, and what happens in the stomach. So uh, heartburn symptoms are typically caused by excess of hydrochloric acid, HCl, in the stomach. HCl is needed and is secreted by our stomach in order uh, for us to be able to digest food that we eat. But when there is excess of HCl, what happens is it gets uh, brought up to the upper part of the stomach, which is called reflux, and that's when we feel heartburn symptoms. I know uh, you guys are young, so you may not uh, really be familiar with heartburn, but unfortunately, as you get older, typically you start having those symptoms. So. The simplest uh, way to relieve heartburn symptoms is to neutralize excess of sodium acid with something like sodium bicarbonate. The reaction produces sodium chloride and a substance called carbonic acid. We talked about carbonic acid before, way back uh, in the beginning of the semester, this was probably February, when we did the identification of the compound experiment, when you were still here uh, in the lab with me. And uh, we talked about the fact that carbonic acid is a very weak acid, which is unstable, and uh, as soon as it forms, it breaks down into sodium, I'm sorry, uh, carbon dioxide and water. So carbonic acid, by the way, is uh, what's in seltzer water. So seltzer water is basically carbonic acid because it's a solution of CO2 in water. So here, the goal of the experiment is to take 
a piece of tablet with a known mass reacted with excess of hydrochloric acid and as a result uh, to get carbon dioxide to be produced because HCl is taken in excess, sodium bicarbonate is going to be a limiting reactant. And so uh, the goal is to measure volume of CO2 because it's a gas. And then based on volume of CO2, to be able to trace it all the way back to moles and grams of sodium bicarbonate. And then once we are able to do that, we can determine mass percent of sodium bicarbonate in the tablet. Remember, the tablet is not pure uh, sodium bicarbonate. It's actually a mixture of various ingredients, including aspirin, and there's one other sort of mystery uh, ingredient. Let's call it that for now. We'll discuss this a little later. So we need to know mass percent of just sodium bicarbonate in the tablet. Mass percent of sodium bicarbonate in the tablet is found as grams of bicarbonate divided by grams of tablet. Again, we're going to start by taking a piece of tablet and weighing it. So we will know grams of uh, tablet we're using for the experiment. So once we find grams of bicarbonate, we should be able to find mass percent bicarbonate. So how do we find grams of bicarbonate if what we're actually measuring in the experiment is actually volume of the CO2, which is a product? Well, the idea is to start with volume of CO2, which originally will be in milliliters. We're going to convert uh, that to moles of CO2. And then from moles of CO2, we're going to go to moles of bicarbonate. It's one to one ratio. Here, so these two are going to be equal. And then for moles of bicarbonate, we can easily find this graph because um, it's easy, I hope, for you to find molar mass of this. So knowing molar mass, the conversion between moles and grams of bicarbonate is fairly straightforward. What's not straightforward right now is how we're we gonna get from volume of CO2 to its moles. And that's where first of two gas laws come into play. We're talking about ideal gas law. So ideal gas law, as you hopefully remember from lecture, and I asked you to review it from your lecture textbook before uh, this week's lab. Um, this is one of the fundamental laws in science, not just in chemistry, which I hope you're familiar with. Uh, PV equals MRT. So let's go over the terms of this equation. P here represents pressure of gas. V represents volume of gas, N is its number of moles, R is what's called universal gas constant, and T is temperature. So um, this important equation allows us to connect volume of gas and its number of moles. So next what I did is I rearranged the ideal gas law to show how moles of CO2 can be found and uh, once I rearranged that equation, I got pressure of CO2 times its volume divided by R divided by T. So a uh, couple of important things. Units are extremely important here. So when you do your calculations on the big table that I'm going to show you a little later, it's in your um, lab manual, it's part of the report for this experiment. It's extremely important to keep track of units for all these various parameters included here. So, pressure of CO2 that is up there um, on the top part of the equation will have to be in ATMs. Volume of CO2 uh, formed in the reaction will have to be in liters. It will not be initially measured in liters, but will have to be converted to liters when calculations are completed. Temperature has to be in degrees Kelvin. And finally, uh, this is your value of universal gas constant that you're supposed to use for this equation, for this um, calculation. Uh, and universal gas constant is equal to um, 0.082 liters times ATM divided by mole divided by Kelvin. Units of R is what uh, actually drives all these units up here. So. Um, that's why your volume has to be liters pressure and ATMs and temperature in degrees Kelvin. And um, next thing we're going to discuss 
is um, how do we find pressure of CO2, just CO2. And um, in order to understand that, we have to consider our experimental setup that I prepared here, which I'm going to use uh, in a later video to show you the actual procedure. But first, let's consider how the setup is made and what's going to happen here. Two things I want to mention. First, um, I did uh, include another video in the module for this experiment that's uh, already posted on Canvas. It's made uh, by a different professor who does a very similar experiment. She's a lot funnier than me, um, a lot more fun, you might say. Um, and uh, they do it in a slightly different way, but the scheme and goal experiment is very, very similar. So I thought I'd include it for your reference so you can kind of watch it and see how uh, this experiment could be done in a slightly different setup. So the setup includes three major parts. In the middle here, you uh, see what's called a burette. Unfortunately, you did not get to use a burette for titrations uh, because of uh, lockdown and uh, issues with public health safety. Um, we could not be on campus back in um, early April. That's when we would have done this experiment. So burette is right here. It's graduated from zero on top to 50 on the bottom. So zero is on top because typically when burette is used, it's filled with liquid. And then uh, as you empty the burette, numbers increase. It means you dispense more and more liquid into your container. But here, burette is going to be filled with liquid. And then uh, the reaction between Alka-Seltzer piece and HCl will take place in this reaction flask. As you can see, reaction flask is connected to the burette via this tubing with the stopper on top. All of this is supposed to be airtight, so no gas will escape. So any CO2 that's formed, most of it anyway, will be um, going through the tubing, will enter the burette, and then we'll push the liquid down. That's how we will know that actually volume of CO2 uh, is being collected here in the burette because of the difference in volume of liquid before and after conducting the reaction. The important issue though is how do we ensure that we can measure accurately the pressure inside the burette. And that's what this third part of the setup is for. So we have a burette, we have a reaction flask, and then we have this third portion of our setup. This here is called leveling bulb. The goal of the leveling bulb, we're going to pour some uh, liquid into the leveling bulb. We're gonna fill about half of the bulb. This tubing here on the bottom, that connects to the bottom of the burette, and most of the burette with liquid. As you can see, the bulb is not uh, stoppered. It's open to the air. Now, if it's open to the air, it's open and open to the surroundings, right? And so the pressure exerted on the liquid inside this bulb is going to be equal to atmospheric or barometric pressure. And so by matching the levels of liquid in the bulb and in the burette, we can ensure that uh, total pressure inside the burette is equal to barometric pressure or atmospheric pressure. Uh, so what gases besides uh, CO2 are going to be present in our burette? Well, first important thing to mention here is that burette is considered closed to the surroundings. You have a stopper here, and then uh, you have liquid water or solution that's going to be placed in the burette blocking this portion of the burette. So this area inside the burette is going to be airtight assuming there are no air leaks, of course. And so uh, there, once we conduct the reaction, there will be CO2. Another guess we have to take into account that will be present in the burette is water vapor. Where will water vapor come from? Well, if you have aqueous solution inside the burette, you can't prevent water from evaporation. So some of the water will evaporate, producing water vapor. So there will be a total of two gases inside the burette. And that, um, actually uh, brings me to uh, the discussion of the second um, gas law that we're using here called Delta's Law of Partial Pressures. This is the law that I also asked you to review before this experiment. Hopefully you've taken a look 
it's a lecture textbook to refresh your memory. And um, you hopefully remember that um, according to Delta's low partial pressures, if you have several gases, two or more, in a closed container, their total pressure is um, equal to the sum of um, individual gases pressures called partial pressures. So if I had three gases, for example, um, the total pressure inside that container would equal to uh, partial pressure of gas one plus partial pressure of gas two plus partial pressure of gas three. For our, for our system, we only have two gases to worry about as we discussed. So in our system, total pressure, because of the level involved, is expected to be equal to barometric pressure, atmospheric pressure. And then uh, this total pressure is going to be equal to partial pressure of CO2 plus partial pressure of uh, aqueous vapor. And so pressure of CO2, partial pressure of just CO2 that is, must be found uh, by difference by taking partial pressure of aqueous vapor and subtracting it from uh, atmospheric or barometric pressure. So you might say, where am I gonna get barometric pressure? Where am I gonna get aqueous pressure, um, pressure of aqueous vapor? Well, both of these will be given to you. So you have to pay attention. You have to know where to look for these. Barometric pressure typically is determined on the day of the experiment in the room where experiment is being conducted. So I uh, looked it up before we started and uh, atmospheric pressure or barometric pressure in this room right now today is equal to 758.2 millimeters of mercury. So uh, atmospheric pressure is given to you in millimeters of mercury. What about pressure of aqueous vapor? When if, uh, if you were doing this experiment here in lab, if you were uh, here right now, each of you, uh, or each uh, pair, you would actually be doing this in pairs, would be given a table like this, which lists vapor pressure of water at various temperatures. Vapor pressure of a substance is clearly a function of temperature. The higher the temperature, the more molecules leave the liquid to go into gas, so vapor pressure of liquid increases as temperature increases. Uh, I did uh, measure room temperature right now, which is also needed for our calculation. It's, uh, calculations, it's 22 degrees in here right now, 22 degrees Celsius, I should say. And uh, I looked up in this table that at 22 degrees Celsius, pressure of aqueous vapor equals to 19.8 millimeters of mercury. So a couple of quick notes for units. I already mentioned this, but I feel it's worth uh, repeating. So here, both barometric pressure and pressure of aqueous vapor are given in orders of mercury. These are not the units your uh, ideal gas law equation requires. So you're going to have to convert pressure from millimeters of mercury to ATM. And temperature here is given in degrees Celsius. It will have to be converted to Kelvin, which I hope you all remember how to do. Quick hint, you just add 273 and get uh, temperature uh, converted to Kelvin. So having uh, said that, um, we will be um, discussing the actual procedure in the next video, but I wanted to show you something real quick. So this is the packet, and um, this, the packets are in this box, and each packet typically contains two humongous tablets like this. And uh, um, I don't think anybody in their right state of mind could ever swallow something like this. So how are these um, tablets taken? Well, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to dissolve a tablet like this in water. Um, and I wanna show you what happens if you just take uh, regular water and you drop the tablet and you probably already know. I'd like to also say that right here in the box, it says effervescent pain relief. In yellow, it says effervescent. So what does this uh, weird word effervescent mean? It means actually uh, producing bubbles. So it kind of is a clue as to what we might see. So I'm going to take this empty beaker. See, it's empty. So don't think I tricked you in any way. I'm gonna add some water to the beaker. 
And I'm going to drop the tablet and we're going to watch and discuss uh, what's happening here. Remember, just water. So what you're seeing uh, is this, in scientific terms, effervescence. In uh, layman um, terms, it's just bubbles being formed and tablet is dissolving and bubbling. So how come um, tablet is bubbling like this? Well, um, you probably could guess that the bubbles that you see here are those of carbon dioxide, but why is CO2 uh, being produced with just water? Doesn't it need acid? And the answer is yes, it does. Sodium bicarbonate, regular baking soda, will never bubble if you just add water to it. So how come it bubbles here? Well, we have to look at other ingredients in the tablet. I told you one ingredient is aspirin, but uh, aspirin, although slightly acidic, is not acidic enough to cause all this effervescence. I mentioned the um, mystery ingredient before, so I wanted to uh, tell you that the third ingredient in a medicine like this is actually citric acid. And citric acid is only added to the tablet in order to create this um, bubbling or effervescent effect. Um, and uh, so right now the tablet has completely dissolved. And one thing I would point out, hopefully you can see that not all of the tablet has dissolved. There's a bunch of uh, solids present on the bottom and there are also white solid particles floating all around uh, on the top. That solid on the bottom is most likely excess of bicarbonate and uh, all these floaties on the top and on the sides is probably aspirin. And so uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because often you would see commercials on TV trying to convince you to buy Alka-Seltzer products because they're quote-unquote faster acting than a regular pill. But the problem is, as you can see, even though tablet uh, appears to have dissolved, in reality it has not. And so um, if you were to take a medicine like this, you'd be smart to maybe take a teaspoon and stir the contents in your glass before drinking it. That at least will help dissolve um, the baking soda remaining. But aspirin will probably not dissolve even after that. So I would basically just kind of question the claims made by commercials and I'm hoping this example will help show you how understanding how science works can make you a better consumer and be a little bit more inquisitive and skeptical about what you might see on TV or what uh, some claims that uh, you may hear in commercials may mean. So in the next video we are doing the actual experiment.